This is part 2 of my series about the Netherlands at the beginning of World War II. The main theme of part 2 is to address the question how many Dutch people sympathised with the German occupation and why. The comments section under part 1 has shown that there was and still is a lot of controversy about this matter. In a number of cases it has led to quite some nasty debates during which it has become clear, at least to me, that especially a contingent of young viewers have a totally misplaced and misguided concept of what actually happened during World War II, and in particular in the Netherlands. Not only does it show that the quality of history lessons worldwide is not what it used to be, but in the absence of proper understanding of the driving forces behind the World War II scene, many make the big mistake of judging history through today's eyes. Projecting today's norms, values, social climate and other factors on historic events has often demonstrated that it leads to the wrong interpretations and wrong conclusions about historic events. It has also been sad to witness how a not negligible percentage of viewers have converted their limited knowledge and opinions about World War II into hate-driven, violent, rude and respectless reactions in the comments section. I am not a historian, but am very interested in history. Therefore I will now do my best to give insight into what I believe actually happened in the Netherlands during World War II, in an as neutral as possible manner, without bringing feelings and emotions into the equation. First of all, it is very important to understand what the situation was like in the Netherlands in the decades preceding the war. Although the Netherlands were neutral during World War I from 1914 to 1918, this war did have an enormous impact on the entire world, especially in an economic sense. It took many years to start to recover from the events of World War I, especially in Europe. In 1929, the United States entered the Great Depression as a direct result of the Wall Street crash. The effects of this depression crossed the ocean and led to a period called the Crisis Years, a global economic crisis that spanned the whole 1930s decade. It was succeeded by a bank crisis and then a debt crisis. These crisis years, during the so-called interbellum, were also deeply felt in the Netherlands. Poverty was widespread, and at its peak in 1935, nearly 20% of the Dutch were unemployed. The Dutch government set up a Werkverschaffingsplan plan aimed at creating jobs that would have value for the entire nation. This work involved digging peat as fuel for homes, digging canals, constructing roads, clearing woods to create farmland, etc. Constructing the Afsluitdijk was also part of this labour provision plan. Most of this work was done by hand. Those who refused to participate in these projects lost their right to poverty care, called Armensorg in Dutch. After World War I, Germany was put in a straitjacket at the Treaty of Versailles in 1918. Especially the French and British did everything they could to make Germany a lame duck, economically and military speaking, in a poorly fought through attempt to prevent Germany rising from its World War I ashes and starting the same onslaught on neighbouring countries again. Historians agree that this policy and approach in effect backfired there was huge unrest during the 1920s in Germany and a period of hyperinflation started, which reached its peak in early November 1923 when the German mark had devalued to ludicrously low levels. On that date, one mark crashed to a value of 100 billionth compared to 1918. Thus, on the 23rd of November 1923, 
the Lenten mark was introduced, linked to the value of gold, whereby no less than 12 zeros were deleted from the deflated currency. On the 30th of October 1924, the new Reichsmark was introduced, with the same value as the Lenten mark, and at an exchange rate of about 4 Reichsmarks to the US dollar. In 1933, the Weimar Republic, that was established in Germany shortly after World War I in 1919, collapsed with the rise of Hitler and his Nazi party. The time was ripe for a change of government, and the German population embraced a new leadership, who promised a new future for Germany, including regained prosperity. What can be said is that if Hitler would not have come to power, it would simply have been somebody else, who would have stood up to dig the German economy out of the huge troubles they were in. On the 24th of February 1920, Hitler established the Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, NSDAP, or in English the National Socialist German Workers' Party, later dubbed the Nazi Party. The word Nazi has an extremely negative ring to it, especially because it is associated with the late atrocities during World War II, and in particular the Holocaust and Hitler's wish to establish the Third Reich with brute force. It has become obvious that a number of viewers who have been uttering the word Nazi as a swear word in their comments have been doing so without fully understanding its origin and meaning. Without of course condoning anything the Nazis did, it is very important to understand why so many Germans embraced the National Socialist Party's ideology and why in the beginning hardly anybody heard alarm bells ringing for what was about to come. By all means, do study the background of Nazism. In a nutshell, the Nazi party upheld the following principles. The interest of the state always outweighs the interests of individuals. For the purpose of the common good, political interests need to be accepted as the main priority of economic organization. Communism is perceived to be in contradiction to these principles, and Semitism as an obstacle to reaching the party's objectives. Therefore, communism needs to be eradicated and anti-Semitism required to stamp out the Jewish influence in society. Online you can read that Hitler outlined the anti-Semitism and anti-communism at the heart of his political philosophy, laid down among other in his book Mein Kampf, as well as his disdain for representative democracy and his belief in Germany's right to territorial expansion through Lebensraum. In 1932 the Nazi party had a landslide victory of the thus far incumbent government under the leadership of President Hindenburg. It got 37% of the votes. After the night of the long knives, and in particular after the death of President Hindenburg on the 2nd of August 1934, political power was concentrated in Hitler's hands. He thus became Germany's head of state, as well as the head of the government, with the title of Führer und Reichskanzler, meaning leader and chancellor of Germany. In effect, Germany became a dictatorship. In today's terms, the Nazi party was an extreme right movement. It is doubtful whether a large part of the German population fully understood who, what and why they had voted for in 1932. The promise of an economic reform aimed at a better future for the country by abolishing the political system that so far had not worked were enough for most Germans to accept a new strong state. In my words, as long as they could piggyback on the success of the new state, there should and would be a glorious future for each individual too. Focusing on the anti-Semitic element in the new German government, it is quite relevant to understand why many Germans had no or hardly any problems with this. This is a sensitive topic that you won't read much about.
What can be stated is that in particular the middle class perceived Jewish businesses and the way Jews penetrated into leadership positions as an eyesore and an obstruction to doing normal business. The cartel-alike business approach by Jews hindered German shopkeepers as well as people in other trades. Already in 1933, the Nazi government incited hatred towards the Jews by starting a campaign to boycott Jewish shops. Deutsche wehrt euch, kauft nicht bei Juden, meaning Germans, defend yourself, don't buy from Jews. In 1940, the anti-Jewish film Der Ewige Jude, The Eternal Jew, portrayed the Jews as vermin. A similar despicable film titled The Jewish Peril was issued in 1941. Both films, by the way, can be found on archive.org. <laughs> Misunderstanding of the Jewish faith, dislike of their appearance, and their rather different way of life was contradictory to having a homogeneous, multicultural society. To say it bluntly, part of the German population disliked and even hated the Jews. I'm inclined to say not dissimilar to what is still happening today in the world. It was not an obsession that only circulated within the German government. On the website of the Anne Frank Society you can read Hitler did not invent the hatred of Jews. Jews in Europe had been victims of discrimination and persecution since the Middle Ages, often for religious reasons. Christians saw the Jewish faith as an aberration that had to be quashed. The idea that Jews belonged to a different people than the Germans, for instance, caught on. End of quote. A proof of the widespread dislike for Jews can be found in the Kristallnacht in the night from the 9th to the 10th of November 1938, whereby in the whole of Germany Jews and their possessions were attacked and 1400 synagogues set on fire. This was only the beginning of the persecution of Jews in Germany. Approximately at the same time as the Nazi party came to power, the Dutch National Socialistische Beweging NSB, emerged in the Netherlands in 1931. This movement was led by Anton Mussert, who, like Hitler, became its sole leader. Similar to the German Nazi party, this movement had fascist characteristics and objectives. A strong government, abolition of individualist voting rights, corporate socio-economic order, economics at the service of the people's community, compulsory labor and social security, as well as restrictions on the freedom of press. In 1933, the movement had only 900 members, which increased to 52,000 by 1936, and then gradually diminished to around 32,000 when the war broke out. This was caused by its radicalization, especially as regards anti-Semitism. By then, the Dutch population knew too well what the party stood for, a Dutch Member of Parliament even openly called them traitors, which was headline news in the newspapers. During the war, the NSB membership rapidly increased to over 101,000 by 1943. Mussert sided fully with the German occupiers. His aim was to establish the Netherlands as an autonomous entity within the German Third Reich. It is interesting to note that the NSB members in particular started to occupy lower level positions in local governments like mayors and magistrates. However, they did not get a foothold in Dutch national government. It was Reichskommissar Seitz Inquart who pulled all the strings. Apparently Hitler didn't think much of Mussert, seen here visiting Hitler in Berlin. The meeting was very brief. The overall majority of the Dutch hated the NSB, which was exacerbated by the violence of its paramilitary order troops called the Weerbaarheidsafdeling WA. Most people considered them to be scum and riffraff in uniform. The NSB, with its WA, had a leading role in the persecution and deportation of Jews. Some historians mention that their results in this respect were higher than in Germany. About 80% of the Dutch Jews, over 105,000, were deported and only just over 5,000 of them survived the war. Watch the film Overkamp Westerbork on my channel. 
Similar to Germany, Jewish people were gradually driven out of public life in the Netherlands and became persona non grata in parks, shops, theatres and city quarters. The key question in this documentary is how many Dutch citizens supported the German occupiers. There are many nuances to this question. One key point is to consider when this support occurred and when it was at its peak. It is too easy to proclaim that such support lasted throughout the full five year duration of the war. Alike in Germany many people were initially ignorant of what the German Nazi party really stood for. The atrocities towards the Jews only came out in the open towards and especially after the end of the war. A famous excuse by many German soldiers was, we haben das nicht gewusst, we never knew that. According to historians, about 70% of the Dutch companies to a certain degree worked for and or with the Germans. Famous companies like Philips, Duff Cars and CNAs can be named. The Dutch Railways, NS, played an active role in transporting Jews to Kamp Westerbork. Towards the end of the war, the Dutch newspaper De Telegraaf became more and more pro-German. The Nederlandse Heidemaatschappij supervised camps where Jews were put to work. Here again, it often was a matter of necessity in order for the business to survive and keep people employed. For example, some Dutch restaurants printed their menus in Dutch and German. Now what about the Dutch government? Did they support the Nazis? The straightforward answer is no. If they would have had sympathy for the Germans, there would have been no need for them to join Queen Wilhelmina in her fleet to London. At the start of the German occupation, Dirk Jan de Geer was Prime Minister. His attitude was weak, and because of his defeatist attitude, in particular proclaiming that the British could never win any war with Germany, Queen Wilhelmina insisted he would be replaced. His successor in September 1940 was Pieter Gerbrandi, who contributed substantially to Wilhelmina's efforts to coordinate the Dutch resistance, albeit from a distance from London. There never were any Nazi sympathizers in Dutch government. As already stated earlier, the Dutch economy was not in a good shape after the crisis years throughout the 1930s. Alike in Germany, many were longing for a radical change in the hope for a better future. Some believed that the future would lie in a new Europe and thus decided to join the Nazis to fight the Communists on the Eastern Front. Wij blijven elkaar trouw en wij zullen samen opmarcheren voor ons volk en vaderland naar de nieuwe toekomst. Hou zie! Ik zweer bij God, deze heilige eet, dat ik in de strijd tegen het Bolshevisme den opperbevelhebber der Duitse Weermacht Adolf Hitler Onvoorwaardelijk zal gehoorzamen en als dapper soldaat bereid zal zijn. Ik weet dat onze mannen in goede handen zijn en ik weet dat zij hun plicht zullen doen. Dus we nemen de naam des Reichsführers, wij willigen dat commando des Reichsführers.
ました。This could explain the rather large numbers of Dutch citizens throwing flowers to the German soldiers as they entered the country in 1940, as well as the support for the approximately 25,000 Dutch young men who joined the Waffen SS to fight the communists on the Eastern Front. In that respect, the communists in Russia were perceived as the common enemy of Germany and the Netherlands. These Dutch SS conscripts were also loaded with flowers during their departure march through The Hague. The number of 25,000 may seem large and is often quoted as a reference to demonstrate that the Dutch largely supported the Nazis. However, in 1940, the Netherlands had a population of 9 million of which about 3 million in the 18 to 40 age group. So in that age group, the numbers that joined the SS was only about 1%. 20 times as many, i.e. about half a million, were transported to Germany to perform forced labor in German Arbeitseinsatz. But surely that should not be considered as collaboration, nor can it be seen as having sympathy for the Nazis. In later war years the cruel nature of the occupiers became more apparent, which surely must have diminished the support for the Nazis even further. As the war progressed, Dutch citizens more and more started to feel the negative aspects of the German occupation. A number of important historic events can be mentioned that must have contributed to diminished sympathy for the occupiers. The huge February strike in 1941, whereby many people refused to work any longer for the Germans. Subsequently, the strike was violently crushed. Wide-scale theft of Dutch resources, metal including hundreds of church bells, agricultural produce, art, fuel, etc. Holland was plundered to the bone. The lack of food and the need for rationing. In 1944 there was a huge winter famine in the northern half of the country. The voedselpositie was zeer ernstig. 
In alle straten waren de winkels gesloten. Voor het weinige dat nog verstrekt werd, stonden lange rijen hongerige mensen te wachten. Duizenden maakten grote tochten om bij de boeren wat eten te bemachtigen. Op het land werden de verloren aren door de hongerende stadsbevolking opgezocht. Geen gas, geen kolen, geen licht. Gehele parken en bossen werden omgehakt om enige warmte in deze verschrikkelijke tijden te brengen. People could not get any fuel for their cars and had to resort to all sorts of creative solutions as seen here. The compulsory Arbeitseinsatz that forced thousands to work in Germany. In The Hague, one third of its population, i.e. 130,000 people, were forced to move due to the construction of the German Atlantic Wall. And finally, more and more awareness of what was happening to the Jews and that many were in hiding. Another point to consider is the level and intensity of collaboration. Again, there are many nuances to consider here, ranging from passive condonance and support of the Nazi ideology, active professional collaboration like voluntary or compulsory working for German organizations, local governments, including mayors, policemen, clerks, judges and others, working for the Dutch railways who played an important role in the deportation of Jews, companies who supported German logistics and warfare productions, those who actively joined the Waffen-SS and Wehrmacht, up to being the worst of the worst by acting as spies, snitches, interrogators, hangmen and traitors. Most people acted on the basis of what they believed needed to be done to stay alive, support their family and hopefully survive the war. Whether that required them to somehow participate in German-oriented activities or not, depended to a large degree on their circumstances and abilities. For example, people who were civil servants before the war must have had great difficulty to choose between finding a job away from the Germans or having to cooperate with them. After all, jobs were not widely available after the crisis years. A third point is what is actually construed as collaboration a train, tram or bus driver, a road worker, a postman, a fireman, a policeman who simply does his or her daily work. They all contribute to the continuity of running the country and thus keeping the economy afloat. Indirectly, such jobs assist in occupying foreign regime. Another category is women who fell in love with German soldiers or provided sexual services. Not all these soldiers should be considered as monsters. Nevertheless, such women were considered to be muffin maiden, crowd girls, and at the end of the war many were punished by publicly cutting off their hair. So there are wide differences between having supported the Nazis out of principle, out of some degree of sympathy, simply out of bare necessity, in either a voluntary or compulsory setting, or other. Hence, there is no generic answer to this key question. The same applies to having sympathy for the occupiers. Here again there are many nuances, ranging from being pleased with the new regime bringing badly wanted change to society, to liking the German way of life, to having friends or family in Germany, to supporting the generic Nazi philosophies without the anti-Semitism and desire for world hegemony extremities, up to supporting the full fascist package. Just to say it is a big mistake to put the same stigma stamp on the forehead of everybody, as so often is done. 
In Dutch we say, je moet niet iedereen over één kamp scheren. And having been, as they called, wrong during World War II, in Dutch, fout, has many interpretations. In recent years, some Dutch archives have been limitedly opened for historians to analyze how many people were in the wrong during World War II. Their estimates are that about one third of the country sympathized with the Germans to some degree, in particular in the early war years. From 2025 onwards, these archives will be open to the general public. This involves a project called Oorlog voor de Rechter van Centraal Archief Bijzondere Rechtspleging, CABR. It will then become possible to examine the 300,000 records about people who are known to have been fout during the war, giving a much clearer picture of the intensity and span of Dutch collaboration and Nazi sympathy. Using this number of 300,000, this comes down to around 3% of the Dutch population. Obviously, not all collaborators have been recorded. Assuming it was double or triple in reality, then the percentage of Dutch people who actively collaborated should not exceed 10%. This is my five cents on this topic, and thus the end of part two. Maybe in a few years' time, a part three could be made that sheds even more light on this topic. Laten wij allen medewerken, opdat Nederland weer spoedig zijn waardige plaats in de rij der vrije volken zal innemen. Thanks for watching.